He is the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, executive director of the Skeptic Society, a monthly columnist for Scientific American, and the author of The Believing Brain. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Shermer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start off with a thought experiment. Imagine you're a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. You're a tiny little Australopithecine afarensis, little brain. Your name is Lucy. <clears throat> Thank you. A lot of people in the Midwest don't get that. <clears throat> Evolution? What? <laughs> Not that, Lucy. The other one. Uh, and, you're, uh, and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator, or is it just the wind? If you think that the rustle in the grass is a dangerous predator, and it turns out it's just the wind, you've made a type 1 error in cognition, you've, a false positive. You thought the wind was connected to something, and it wasn't. A was connected to B, and it wasn't. Uh, so that's a false positive, but that's relatively harmless. But if you think that the rustle in the grass uh, is just the wind and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, you're lunch. Congratulations, you've just been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool early before reproducing. <laughs> and we are the descendants of those who are most likely to make type 1 errors, false positives, versus type 2 errors, false negatives. That is to say, why can't you just stay in the grass and collect enough data to get the answer right? And the answer is that predators don't wait around for prey animals to collect more data. That's why they stalk and sneak up on their prey animals, so they can't get enough data. So we evolved the propensity to make snap decisions and make one kind of error more likely than another kind of error. And that kind of error, that false positive, that's superstition. That's magical thinking. That's assuming A is connected to B. It's a true pattern, and it isn't, and you're wrong. That's the basis of finding false patterns like God's. Now, what's the difference between the wind and a dangerous predator? The wind is an inanimate force. A dangerous predator is an intentional agent. And his intention is to eat me, and that can't be good. So what we also do, in, in, in addition to finding these meaningful patterns, is infuse in them agency. That, that is, it's alive, it's real, it has intention, and its intention is not good. So I better assume it's real. And this is the basis of animism and spiritism and polytheism and monotheism and the belief in angels and aliens and demons and spirits and poltergeists and gods. Gods are invisible agents who run the world, who control things, who create these patterns, who are these patterns that we use to explain things. All cultures everywhere in the world have created god beliefs. Gods with these intentional, uh, uh, that are intentional agents. We now have a lot of evidence from cognitive psychology that this begins at a very early age, perhaps as early as age two or three. I, I'll just give you one experiment among many. Uh, Jesse Baring's research with little children uh, who are brought into a room and they're given one of these little balls with Velcro on it and you throw it at the dartboard and it sticks on it. That's the goal. So they're brought into the room, and, but they're not allowed to just do that with their good hand. They're turned, they're turned around and they have to do it backwards. So they're really bad at it, as any of us would be. And, and then uh, the experimenter leaves the room, and, and he says, just do the best you can and come out and tell me how you did. So of course, they all walk up there and just stick it on the thing, right? <laughs> all right, part two of the experiment. Uh, the little children are brought in, and each of them is told, right next to the dart dartboard is a chair here. On the chair is Princess Anne. She's an invisible princess, and she can see everything you're doing. Experimenter leaves the room. All of a sudden, the children stop going up to cheat. The shadow of enforcement, the, the sort of infusion of agency in, of an invisible being in a chair that sees what we do, keeps track of our moral behavior, begins at a very early age. Our brains have evolved this capacity for agency. That's the earliest God beliefs. Okay, next line of evidence. Here's what happened about five to seven thousand years ago. These animistic simple God beliefs and sort of social religions that evolved to help us uh, live together as a social primate species began to break down as populations grew from a couple dozen to a couple hundred individuals to thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people in state societies, from bands and tribes to chieftains and states. We needed some more formal means of behavior control and enforcing the rules of social cooperation. Two institutions evolved for that, government and religion. Government says, here's a copy of the rules, everybody gets one, and here's the punishments if you break the rules. 
Religion says if you think you got away with it and you cheated the state, nah, there's an eye in the sky that knows all and sees all, and in the next life, justice will be served. That's a very powerful force for social control. Again, if it happens with little kids, you can do it with adults, uh, which is what churches are all about. So that's the modern version. That's what happens with that. We get this a lot. You know, how do you explain this or that? I think people's experiences are real. Absolutely. I think most people don't just make up stories, although some do. Most people, when they experience, or they describe some miraculous, fantastic spiritual experience that they've had, they really mean it. Now, so the question is, what does it represent? Something out there in the world or something in, inside the brain? Well, we now know enough about neuroscience to know that the brain does generate a lot of these kind of spiritual experiences, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, sense presences, hallucinations, delusions. Uh, there's whole books about this, and, um, and so the experiences are real. What we want to know as scientists is, well, what do they actually represent? I mean, we know we can replicate these in the lab by doing certain things and causing people's brains to have these experiences. So most likely, the what's more likely question, that it's out there or that it's in here, the overwhelming evidence is that they're in here. According to the Oxford University Press's World Christian Encyclopedia, 84% of the world's population belongs to some form of organized religion and believes in some form of God, which at the end of this year is about 5.9 billion people. Christians have about 2 billion of those 5.9 billion. About half of those are Catholics. Muslims come in at just a tad over 1 billion. Hindus at around 850 million. Buddhists at almost 400 million, and then a several hundred million other ethno-religionists, animists, and other God-believers around the world. Worldwide, there are about 10,000 distinct religions, each one of which may be further subdivided and classified. Christians, for example, may be apportioned among about 34,000 different denominations. From a scientist's perspective, such Percentages uh, believe cry out for an explanation. Why do so many people believe these things? But from a skeptic's perspective, which is what I do, what are the chances that these guys got the right God and the right religion and the billions of other people that don't believe what they believe got it wrong? When you leave the house tonight, just ask yourself that question. What are the chances that they just happened to get it right. And the tens of billions of people that lived before Jesus, they never heard of it. The tens of billions of people that have lived since then who don't believe that, they just happen to be wrong? Or is it more likely that all of these religion and God beliefs are socially constructed, psychologically constructed, and that none of them are right in any reality sense, in any ontological sense? They're all constructed this way. So um, where do we get our morals from? Um, it, it can't be from the Bible, because almost nobody obeys, certainly not the Old Testament, and, and most of the New Testament. I mean, death penalty for adultery, there goes half of Congress. I mean, mm. nobody, <laughs> nobody is going to do this, right? So we pick and choose, we cherry pick from the, the holy books based on something else, something else that's happened that I referenced in my opening statement of there's been this other change that's happened, this secularization of morality. That is, you have to actually have good reasons for why you hold certain moral principles, and you, better, and you should be able to articulate them. Uh, and so that's been the, the changer. So even if you and I both listen to the still small voice within to decide what's right or wrong, Dinesh, um, I'm claiming you're not getting it from the Bible, and I'm not either. We're getting it from somewhere else. I think we've evolved this propensity to have moral emotions, and then culture tweaks them, and we've been getting progressively more moral. But, but how as a back-of-the-envelope calculation within an order of magnitude ac accuracy, we can safely uh, conclude that over the last 10,000 years of history, there's been about 10,000 different religions and roughly about 1,000 different gods. Again, the house question for you, which root side of the room you leave on tonight. What is the probability that Yahweh is the one true God in Amun-Ra, Aphrodite, Apollo, Baal, Brahman, Ganesha, Isis, Mithras, Osiris, Shiva, Thor, Vishnu, Wanton, Zeus, and the other 986 gods are all false gods. You guys are atheists, just like me, of all the gods I just rattled off. Some of us just go one god further. Now, think about this as another thought experiment. If you happen to be born in, say, the United States or England in the, last, in the 20th century, there's a good chance that you believe 
that Yahweh is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe who manifested into flesh through Jesus of Nazareth. If you happen to have been born in India in the 20th century, there's a very good chance you're a Hindu who believes that Brahma is the unchanging, infinite, transcendent creator of all matter, energy, time, and space, and who manifests into flesh through Ganesha, the blue elephant god who is the most worshipped divinity in India. To an anthropologist from Mars, these are all indistinguishable. Of course, they're individually different, but taking the big picture, they're all indistinguishable in that sense. Even within the three great Abrahamic religions, who can say which is the right one? Christians believe that Jesus is the Savior, and you must accept him to uh, receive eternal life in heaven. Jews do not accept Jesus as their Savior. Neither do Muslims. In fact, roughly 2 billion of the world's 5.9 billion don't uh, accept that. So what happens to them? Again, are they really right and all those other good people who believe just as passionately as they do are wrong? Where Christians believe that the Bible is an inherent gospel handed down from the deity, Muslims believe that the Koran is the perfect word of God. It's unfortunate that the creator of the universe wrote more than one holy book. Christians believe that Christ is the latest prophet. Muslims believe that Muhammad is the latest prophet. Mormons believe that Joseph Smith is the latest prophet. And stretching this track of thought just a little bit more, Scientologists believe that the science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard was the latest prophet. So many prophets, so little time. When I was a Christian uh, and I matriculated at Pepperdine University, I, I was in what I call the bubble. I was in the bubble where everybody around you believes. And in that bubble, the Christian worldview, like any other worldview, is internally consistent, it's inher inherently logical, it's reinforced by everybody around you until you step outside of the bubble. What happened with me is I went to graduate school and I started to study social psychology, anthropology, psychology of beliefs, and so on. And there I realized that uh, none of those arguments actually make sense in and of themselves, the arguments for God's existence. What it, what it became clear to me is that what happens is, is you you arrive at beliefs for non-rational, non-smart reasons, and then you back into it after the fact with rational reasons to justify it. We call this the confirmation bias. And uh, so for me, I think there's overwhelming evidence that I've given you tonight that uh, there's good anthropological, social science reasons why people believe in God that, that, that doesn't prove there's a God, but it proves that we create gods in our heads. In addition to that, I don't think there's any evidence to support that there actually is a God out there separate from our beliefs. But finally, my final point is this, is that I don't even think it's possible for there to be a God, at least not a supernatural God. In this way, if God is supernatural, that is, outside of space and time, there's no way for us to know it. Therefore, whatever God is, it would have to be a natural being, or at least some kind of a being that reaches in to stir the particles. And if he does, then we should be able to measure it, because that's what we do as scientists. We measure the motions of particles. And so far, we have no evidence of that. So therefore, um, I think that the most we could hope to find would be some kind of a natural being, in which case it would just become part of science, and that would be the end of the whole God concept. Flood myths, very common throughout history. Predating the biblical Noachian flood story by centuries, the Epic of Gilgamesh was written around 1800 BC, warned by Babylonian earth god Ea that other gods were about to destroy all life on a flood, by a flood. Utnapushtim was instructed to build an ark in the form of a cube, a cube, <laughs> 120 cubits on each side, 180 feet, roughly speaking, uh, with seven floors, each divided into nine compartments in which two of every animal is to be brought onto the, onto the ship. Virgin birth myths likewise spring up throughout time and geography. Among those alleged to have been conceived without the usual assistance of the male lineage, and by the way, Mr. Hitchens, this comes from your brother's book, Dionysus, Perseus, Buddha, Attis, Krishna, Horus, Mercury, Romulus, and of course, Jesus. Consider the parallels between Dionysus, the ancient Greek god of wine, and Jesus of Nazareth. Both were said to have been born from a virgin mother who was a mortal woman but were fathered by the king of heaven. Both allegedly returned from the dead, transformed water into wine, introduced the idea of eating and drinking the flesh and blood of the creator, and to have been the liberator of mankind. Flood myths, not original to you. Virgin birth myths, not original to you. Resurrection myths, not original to you. Osiris is the Egyptian god of life, death, and fertility, and is one of the oldest gods for whom records have survived. Osiris first appears in the pyramid texts around 2400 BC. 
2400 before that other guy, by which time his following was already well established. Widely worshipped until the compulsory repression of pagan religions in the early Christian era, Osiris was not only the redeemer and merciful judge of the dead and the afterlife, he was also linked to fertility, most notably and appropriately for the geography, the flooding of the Nile. By the way, there is a, a geographical link between flood myths and bodies of water that flood. Not universal floods, just where you happen to live. The kings of Egypt themselves were inextricably connected with Osiris in death, such that when Osiris rose from the dead, so would they in union with him. By the time of the new kingdom, not only the pharaohs, but the mortal men and women who built the pyramids. So here's what happened. The pharaohs figured out that if you offer eternal life for the workers, they'll work harder and you don't have to pay them as much. So Mark's got that right, one of the few things he got right. The opiate of the masses. The masses don't need promises of an afterlife. They need sustenance now. This is a problem with religion. So that's where that comes from. First, you just want, as a pharaoh, a king, a leader, you just want eternal life for yourself. Forget the people. Well, then you find out they'll work harder, and they'll support you more if you give them some alms like, like eternal life. Shortly after the crucifixion of Jesus, there rose another Messiah, Apollonius of Asia Minor, whose followers claimed he was the son of God, that he was able to walk through closed doors, heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise the dead girl back to life. He was accused of witchcraft, sent to Rome, before the court was jailed, but escaped. After he died, his followers claimed he appeared to them and ascended into heaven. This um, redemption after being oppressed is a very common myth throughout history. And you can understand the psychology behind it. The Native Americans in 1890 began a Messiah myth with a Paiute Indian, Wavoka, who received visions of God. He was thought to be the Messiah or the deliverer of the Messiah, in which the buffalo would all return, the white man would leave and go back to Europe, and life would become better again. This is what oppressed peoples do. They make up stories that makes them feel better. It's often claimed that you can't prove a negative. Let's say atheists, we can't prove there is no God. Okay, I can prove that humans created gods and religions, and I just did. And there's, there's 50 more stories like this of, of uh, the geographical location, the time you happen to have been born, the anthropology of religion, the psychology of religion, the sociology of religion. We, we know exactly how this happens now, all the way down to the neurology, the neuroscience of religion. We know that people are making this up. Now, of course, you can make the argument, well, God planted the God module in the brain so he could talk to us or something. How come we all seem to talk to different gods then? Are there just a bunch of them out there and they're competing for our brains? Why is it, uh, as, as Dan Barker pointed out, there's very little agreement amongst believers. Why is that? So my conclusion then is that, as you think about the House vote tonight, again, what's more likely? It's obvious that all these other gods are made up. You already know that. You agree with me on that. You're all atheists for all those other gods. So I would just implore you to go one God further. Thank you. All right.